Recently, General Motors announced they're going all EV by 2035. Quite a statement when you consider that no company has made a profit selling electric cars, not credits, electric cars, which begs the question, how do they intend to be a going concern? And reading between the lines, they're banking on the government to pay the freight on the R&D until it hits a point of profitability. Then that begs another question, how do they make money now in the near term as well as in the medium term? Well, this is kind of a dirty little secret. Most car companies don't make money selling cars by volume. They make money on a very small subset of very profitable cars. And for General Motors, this would be the most profitable one they make. So if you're going to change it, it better be good. So an admission right at the top. I am incredibly excited about this one because no, it is not a 6.2 liter gasoline V8. Rather, it is a three liter turbocharged diesel, 277 horsepower and 460 pound feet of torque. Now the obvious question is, how does that compare to the gasoline V8? Well, in terms of horsepower, yeah, it's down. It's down by 143 horsepower, but the torque is exactly the same. Now there is an option with either engine, either two wheel drive, meaning rear wheel drive or four wheel drive. In either case, it goes through a 10 speed torque converter automatic. Now, you and I, we do need to kind of decipher performance figures of what this vehicle is, and that would be towing and efficiency. Towing is pretty respectable, 7,800 pounds, and keep in mind this is the four-wheel drive. If it was a two-wheel drive, it would be 8,000 pounds. Now, if it was a V8, again, a comparison here, it would be 200 pounds more in either one of those figures. Then there's the efficiency, which is the currency of a diesel. Here, very respectable when you consider the size of this vehicle. 20 in the city, 26 on the highway. Now again, as a basis of comparison to the V8, that is 7 MPG more in either one of those figures. For math nerds, that's about 20% more efficient. You know how you guys like to complain about those 5,000 pound German SUVs? Well, you're going to look fondly back on those days. 6,000 and 15 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 2,728 kilograms. Now, there are a couple of nuances that impact this. Let's say for the sake of discussion, this were the longer wheelbase version of the Escalade, It'd be about 160 pounds more. If it were an Escalade that was only two wheel drive, it would be about 200 pounds less, which would bring it below 6,000 pounds, which would mean it would not qualify for an accelerated depreciation schedule with the US government. But I am not a tax attorney. Let's get to the business at hand and have a more relaxed visit together. Oh, that's pretty good. It picks up about 2,500 RPM. It likes to pull to about 5,000 or 5,500 RPM, but this is where you and I need to be rather honest about the delta between this and the gas V8. And the reality is the gas V8, it's downright a quick vehicle, even a large Escalade with that V8. Here, it's not that it's slow. This is still a somewhat quick vehicle with a diesel engine, but the Delta is much more pronounced at zero to 30 miles an hour, basically from a standing start. However, above 30 miles an hour, really passing power, that's where that large turbo really does a lot of work in moving a 6,000 pound vehicle. And the difference between this and the V8 in terms of passing power alone is negligible, one where you really wouldn't notice it. The only real dead giveaway is the acoustics here. It's not like a BMW or Mercedes diesel from a couple of years ago where you barely notice it. Here you notice it at low acceleration, you notice it at high acceleration. That said, uh, the transmission at uh, 10 speeds, 9 speeds, those kind of transmissions I'm usually not a fan of because I feel it's like one or too many gears. Eight speed's kind of perfect. Anything beyond that, they do a lot of hunting. They don't really match the personality of the engine very well. This is a completely different kettle of fish. This not only matches the personality of this engine, the shifts are virtually imperceptible. Now there are two important aspects we need to address design and some architectural changes. Design, that's an easier discussion to have because these, if we're honest with one another, they 
are boxes on wheels. And it's not just the Cadillac, it's the Range Rover, it's the BMW, it's the Mercedes. They're all a two box design and how they differentiate themselves is how they deal with corners and some of the finer details. Like for example here, they've gone with this exercise of balancing a more mature design and taking out some of the aggression, taking out some of the brashness. And I kind of miss that aggression because that's kind of what Escalades are all about. Me personally, I prefer the design of the GLS because that shape is a bit more organic in its corners. Then there are the architectural changes. And here are things like magnetic ride control or 22 inch wheels. That makes the trip. But one thing that has changed that is rather important in terms of ride quality as well as driving dynamics would be a switch to an independent rear suspension. But before we try that out in the road, and now we press on to another architectural change, but one that is not as readily apparent when one considers what an Escalade is, and that is a gargantuan vehicle. This one's a bit bigger, believe it or not, but in two usable areas, uh, specifically the wheelbase, and that's where you package more people and more dogs and the overall length of the vehicle. Uh, for example, the wheelbase is about five inches longer. The overall length is about eight inches longer. Now that's all fine and good, but what the hell does that mean to us? Well, the best basis of comparison is vehicles that are already out and about on the road for a couple of years now, and that would be the GLS and the X7. X7 is a good example. That's an inch longer in wheelbase, but the overall length is eight inches shorter. The GLS is kind of a similar story. That's 2.5 inches longer in wheelbase, but seven inches shorter in overall length. Amongst all of that, the thing that jumps out at you immediately is a significant change in the ride quality. It's not really a vehicle where we need to discuss pitch, squat, dive, and roll. You push this thing too much, you're gonna have a lot of each. But here, it's not just the independent suspension that improves the ride quality, and I would say the driving dynamics. The other thing that goes into it, and I would say it's about 50%, is the extra wheelbase. The extra length of the vehicle is going to make the vehicle a bit more supple to drive. Drilling down a bit more into some finer details of the steering, and here, no real need to have a huge discussion because the steering does exactly what it's designed to do. It's more old world Cadillac steering rather than new world V Blackwing steering. I wouldn't say there's a lot of feedback. I wouldn't say it's direct and I would definitely not say there's a lot of weight there. It's very light and it's designed to be light because that's the way Escalades are. So I'm really not gonna complain here. Now kind of bringing all of these disparate parts together, it adjusts the ride height depending on the speed. So on highways or freeways, something like that, when you're driving the car at higher speeds, it lowers the height of the vehicle, but then you notice it when you get to a stoplight, you can feel the vehicle raise the ride height. And this is the point I would argue is the most important here. It's a more cohesive driving package. Is it like a GLS or a BMW X7? No. The GLS, I would argue, dynamically is a bit sharper. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the Absence Game with today's contestant. What I believe to be the first ever Escalade we are featuring in a round of this game. This one, the 2021 Cadillac Escalade Premium Luxury Four-Wheel Drive for a base price of $85,995. Now, I do feel it prudent to point out two rather important facts. The most affordable Escalade would be $77,000. And number two, that engine. We've already determined this with the diesel is about $86,000. How much would it be with a V8? About $86,000. Meaning there is no upcharge for the diesel, or depending on your look at it, there would be no upcharge for the gasoline V8. That led me down a bit of a rat hole of mental gymnastics. How much would one save operating this as opposed to the V8? And I used about 15,000 miles a year and fuel costs at $3.50 a gallon. And this came out to be about $2,000 a year, where the V8 came out to be about $2,700 a year, which really begs a question. Is $700 a year savings enough for the kind of person who can afford a $100,000 vehicle, or does that just appeal to OCD cheapskates like me? Anyway, let's press on to the color. Dark Moon Blue Metallic. This is a fantastic color. One must see it in the sunlight. It is a bargain at $625. That is paired with the full leather brandy seats that have dark atmosphere accents. 
$2,000. Then we press on to the stereo, the AKG 36 speaker stereo system. Notice it is not a Bose, $4,300. Then the driver's assistance package. This is a lot of things, but the biggest parts of it is the air ride and the adaptive cruise control for $3,650. Then we press on to arguably the most important option fitted to this specific vehicle, which would be the performance package. Now, yes, it does include the trailer brake controller, as well as an application to do all the trailering stuff. But more important than that, the electronic limited slip differential and something very important in both Corvettes as well as Cadillacs, the magnetic ride control $2,700, then something that I am a complete sucker for, night vision, $2,000. Then the rear seat entertainment system. I never understood this because you can buy an iPad from Costco for like, what, 500 bucks? This is $1,995. I would suggest going the Costco route. And then the running boards. This is kind of a nice touch, kind of expensive as well, $1,750. And then the only other thing we add is the destination handling from Arlington in the great state of Texas, $1,295 for a total retail price of $106,310. And now the elephant in the room, which would be the interior design. And here, there are a lot of moving parts. Let's start with the obvious, and that would be the screens. Now, if you speak to the folks at Cadillac, they will tell you that screen is the size of a television you would buy at Costco. Now, that is not exactly the truth. Really, it's three screens that kind of look like two screens. You can see the layers from that camera over there. There's one screen which serves as a trip computer. It's about seven inches. Then this screen, this is all the usual stuff you would expect right in front of you. That's about 14 inches. And this one is between 16 and 17 inches. And that's all the infotainment. Again, speaking to the folks at Cadillac, they'd be quick to tell you that is the first automotive application of a curved OLED screen. But then if I want to move the map from there to there, I would go one step down and it turns into a map right in front of you. Very similar to what we've seen in Audis for a couple of years now. But then there is a party trick here. So you know how we talk about in Mercedes episodes, the augmented reality navigation. And what that system does is bring together disparate layers of metadata. So think like the GIS data from the maps, a live feed from the forward facing camera, and then it overlays graphics like arrows on the actual live feed. So it shows turn by turn directions in the infotainment screen. Cadillac does it a bit different where it has the augmented reality system right in front of you. So as you are driving, you have like a wide screen of the road in front of you. And even I have to admit, this is an incredibly useful trick, specifically when the navigation system is switched on. And then talking about party tricks, there is night vision fitted to this vehicle. The next interior item that you and I need to focus on is the fit and finish. And here overall, it is a sizable improvement, kind of like we experienced in the Corvette, but in other areas, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So all the areas that are kind of your hip point and above, very good fit and finish. Also like to point out really good color and trim choices here. However, when you get to below your hip point, the degradation and some of the build quality, not great. Now all of them do it, even in the GLS and the X7, even in that Rolls Royce, they did it. But here, the degradation, it falls off a cliff. It's one area that I would ask for improvement. Then we need to press on to the most important point, and that would be the UX. This is kind of a model of a good hybrid of having the fancy screens that all the kids love to use nowadays. It's all touch sensitive over there. However, there is a good complement of toggle switches. So all the HVAC is all toggle switches. And then it's got a unified controller down here, a real volume knob, and then you can control everything in the infotainment screen over here. Overall, I have been impressed by the UX interaction of this system, and I would hope other OEMs would take notice. Now we have to circle back to the top of the episode to answer the question, is it good? Not only is it good, it is now a credible alternative to a GLS, an X7, and absolutely to a Range Rover. And yes, it's the same equation as those vehicles. It just goes about its business with a completely different personality. And when you think of the impact this has had culturally for the past, what, 20 some odd years, and how it appeals 
to virtually every demographic, I don't think folks would have a problem with that slightly different personality, which brings us to the wish list. And here, once again, we have to circle back to the top of the episode because my ask is some electrification. No, not a full EV at this point. I'm thinking a 48 volt mild hybrid system or a 48 volt system for both the hybrid as well as the suspension paired with a diesel. And here's why I say that. When you think about that in a hybrid mode, you're already at what, 27 MPG, 26 MPG here. With a hybrid, could get to almost 40 in a vehicle this size, but then if there was some EV only driving range, the idea of plugging it in and being able to drive it around during the day without having to put any gas in it, again, a vehicle this size with that kind of interior, there's really nothing else out there like that. And I think that would be a game changer. Yeah. It, could be expensive, but it already is expensive. So I don't think there's really a big problem of price sensitivity for adding a battery that could go a hundred miles. And this is the point of the episode where I turn this around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And can I say that stereo, if you are into country music, especially considering this is a cowboy Cadillac or like indie singer songwriters, the stereo kicks. Until I see you in the next episode, bis später.